Welcome on behalf of SWAT UK to this technical video. My name is David Norris. I'm the training director at SWAT UK. I'm here with Adrian Gibbons, our Hello. managing director and one of our audit and reporting specialists. Um, there are big changes coming up for companies uh, in the future as we move towards adopting FRS 102 and Adrian's going to tell us a little bit about it. So Adrian, is it really a big change? Yes, David, I think it's probably one of the biggest changes we've seen in the UK in the last six to eight years and it is the final stage in our harmonization of reporting standards with Europe and it will have a big impact on all companies within the UK over the next two years. Okay, thank you Adrian. So we need to delve into this in a little bit more detail. There's lots of information on our full courses program but for a short update of some of the key points I'm going to invite Adrian to go through to the presentation area and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. Great, thank you, thank you David. Hello, welcome to this video presentation on FRS 102. My name is Adrian Gibbons and I'm going to take you through some of the key changes under FRS 102. FRS 102 is a major document and represents one of the biggest changes to reporting standards in the UK over probably the last 10 years and it is the final stage in our harmonisation with European standards. I'm going to cover five key areas, clearly in the length of time that we have today I'm not going to do them in any great detail and it's going to be important for you whether you're an accountant in practice or whether you're an accountant in industry to perhaps get some further detailed training on the impact of these changes on the clients and businesses that you deal with. Let me start off with the first key change which is identifying the accounting framework under which you are going to be reporting. If we talk about 2015 for a moment, for accounting periods beginning, that's beginning on or after the 1st of January 2015, then if you're a micro entity, you'll be using the micro entity rules in the Frizzy 2015. If you're a small company, you'll be using the full version of the Frizzy 2015. And if you don't qualify as a small company, so you're a medium or large company, then you'll be applying the full version of FRS 102. Moving forward and looking at how the accounting regime is going to change, from the 1st of January 2016, if you're a micro entity, you're going to have your very own reporting standard. That'll be the financial reporting standard for micro entities, but the standard itself will be based on FRS 102. If you're a small company, you will be required to adopt the reduced disclosure version of FRS 102. So you will effectively move from the Frizzy 2015 to the reduced disclosure version of FRS 102. If you don't qualify as a small company and you are therefore a medium or large company, then you'll be applying the full version of FRS 102 for your accounting periods beginning on or after the 1st of January 2016. So over the next two years, we're going to see a fair number of changes to the reporting regime. And it is going to be important for you to understand which reporting regime applies to which accounting period, which will therefore dictate not only the accounting treatment that you adopt, but also the disclosure and the layout in your accounts. The next couple of slides look at a summary of the accounting framework from the 1st of January 2015 and the accounting framework from the 1st of January 2016. The second key change that I wanted to talk about is the layout of your accounts. The balance sheet won't really change. FRS 102 is what's known as a Companies Act 2006 compliance statement and therefore the balance sheet will look more or less like the balance sheet looks now. What will change though is your profit and loss account and this may confuse quite a lot of people out there in the real world when looking at their accounts because they'll be used to looking at the profit and loss account and therefore they will look at the new statement that's called the Statement of Comprehensive Income and will assume that it's a profit and loss account. One of the key differences between a profit and loss account and the Statement of Comprehensive Income 
is that the statement of comprehensive income mixes both realized profits and realized losses with unrealized profits and unrealized losses. And for those of you who work for companies or deal with companies that pay dividends, the statement of comprehensive income will also mix up distributable movements and non-distributable movements. So we are going to have to be very careful how we interpret this new statement. FRS 102 allows you two formats for the statement of comprehensive income. You can either have a single format in which both your trading results and your valuation movements are reported in a single statement or you can have a split statement where you have your trading results presented and then a statement of other comprehensive income presented as a separate statement at the bottom of your trading statement. In the second layout most people will probably elect to call the first statement the profit and loss account and then have a statement of other comprehensive income underneath the profit and loss account. And we believe that the two statement layout will be very common in the UK but it will still end up in a single figure that gets transferred to the profit and loss account reserve and that single figure will still be a mixture of both realised and unrealised profits and also and perhaps more importantly distributable and non-distributable profits. So you will need to be careful how you look at what looks like the profit and loss account and how you interpret the end result for an entity. It's also perhaps important to realise that for most companies when moving from their existing reporting regime to the new reporting regime under FRS 102 that generally their profits go down. So if you have an external user for your accounts and they are particularly sensitive to your reported profits, then you may want to be talking to them about the impact of you moving from your existing reporting regime to FRS 102. What follows next is an example of both layouts for the statement of comprehensive income. So on the next four slides, I've set out, first of all, a single statement of comprehensive income, and then the split statement where the first statement is called the profit and loss account and the second statement is called the statement of comprehensive uh, income. The next major area of change is something that all directors need to think about when moving from their existing reporting regime to the new FRS 102 reporting regime. That movement from your old reporting regime to your new reporting regime is referred to as a transition and FRS 102 has some detailed transitional rules set out within it. The transitional rules are very complicated and I'm not even going to scratch the surface of the transitional rules in this presentation. However, I do want to mention one area where you have an option and that's the area of deemed cost. Most of you are familiar with the idea of perhaps revaluing one of your fixed assets. Perhaps if you've got a property in your balance sheet you have at some stage in the past considered revaluing that property. One of the problems with adopting a policy of revaluation is it can be quite onerous and you are required under FRS 102 as you were required under the old reporting regime to keep your valuations up to date on a regular basis and a lot of people didn't want to go to the costs and the hassle of updating their valuations. Under the transitional rules you have a one-off option to adopt what is known as deemed cost Deemed cost is a valuation for your fixed assets. So your property, your plant and equipment, your investment properties, even in some cases your intangible assets could be restated at the transitional date to a valuation which is taken on as deemed cost. Now the impact of that is to uplift the values of your assets at the transitional date. But the key benefit is that you don't adopt a policy of revaluation going forward and therefore the onerous rules 
that require you to keep the valuation up to date won't affect you. So it's a one-off opportunity to lift up the values of your fixed assets, perhaps strengthening your balance sheet and improving the look of the balance sheet without adopting an onerous revaluation policy. Now it's a choice, you don't have to do it, you don't have to adopt deemed cost, but a lot of directors should consider whether they wish to, at the transitional date, adopt this policy and strengthen their balance sheet. And so it is something, if you're an accountant representing a company, you perhaps should discuss with your auditors or with the accountants who prepare your statutory accounts. If you're an accountant in practice, it's an option that you should make your clients aware of so they consider whether they wish to uplift their fixed assets using deemed cost. It is not a requirement to uplift all fixed assets, but it is a requirement to uplift across categories of fixed assets. So you can't just uplift the value on one property and not uplift the, prop the value on another property. If you're going to uplift the value to deemed cost, you have to do it across all properties. Equally, you can't pick and choose within your plant and equipment which plant and equipment you uplift to deemed cost and which plant and equipment you leave at historical cost. It has to be done across categories of assets. But for a lot of clients, it is a good opportunity to improve the look of their balance sheet. The next two slides that you're going to see just summarise, first of all, those assets that can be affected by deemed cost and also the definition of what deemed cost is. The fourth area on my list of key changes is deferred tax. Now, I know that quite a lot of you listening to this uh, video will immediately switch off the minute I mention deferred tax, but you just want to stay with me for a moment. Under the existing UK GAAP accounting rules, deferred tax is only provided in certain areas, and particularly if we revalued a property or we revalued some other kind of asset with no intention of selling that asset, then we wouldn't provide for the deferred tax. FRS 102 has what's known as a deferred tax plus provision. And the plus provision means that we have to provide deferred tax on all valuation movements, regardless of whether we intend to trigger the tax charge by disposing of the asset. Now that's quite important to those of you who have in the past revalued your assets. Because if you've revalued your assets in the past, you will need to set up a deferred tax provision and then provide for deferred tax on any valuation movements going forward. The impact of that on your accounts is that the deferred tax element of your tax charge will increase and therefore your profits will go down. It also means that you'll have a deferred tax liability that's perhaps larger than you're used to sitting on your balance sheet. And so that will impact on both the reported profits for the year and also the way your balance sheet looks in terms of its liabilities. So deferred tax is going to create a number of issues for a number of companies and it is one of the major areas of change in terms of FRS 102. Again, those of you who are in industry or are representing companies as perhaps the finance director will need to just have a look at the impact of deferred tax on your balance sheet and on your profit and loss account. Those of you who work in practice will just need to make sure that you understand the extension of deferred tax because it does mean that for a lot of companies where in the past deferred tax has been not material and therefore you've not provided for it, deferred tax may become material, particularly if they've got valuation movements sitting in the balance sheet. So there is a slide coming up now that summarises the deferred tax position, but you just need to make sure you understand what's going on. Finally, in my summary of key changes under FRS 102, I just want to talk about fair value accounting. FRS 102 has a major impact in the UK in that it introduces mandatory fair value accounting into the UK for the first time. Now, fair value accounting is very closely linked to the concept of financial instruments. Now, again, before you all switch off, 
just don't get too worried by the, the terminology. A financial instrument can be almost anything. Okay, a financial instrument can be a trade debtor, it can be a trade creditor, it can be your bank at cash, uh, your cash at bank rather, it can be almost anything you want it to be on the balance sheet. The important thing though is that we understand how we account for our financial instruments. Some of the more common financial instruments, the accounting treatment is already effectively fair value. If you take trade debtors, for example, the requirements of FRS 102 are that your trade debtors should be accounted for at the level of expected cash receivable from that trade debtor. In other words, the amount of money they're going to pay you. The accounting treatment for trade debtors now is to state trade debtors at the amount of money you expect to receive for the trade debtor. Trade creditors. The accounting treatment for trade creditors under FRS 102 is to account for the expected cash outflow required to settle the obligation. Or in other words, the amount of money it's going to cost you to clear the trade creditor, which is the accounting treatment for it now. Both of those accounting treatments are effectively fair value accounting and don't represent any change. Where we're going to have to be careful is where you have a more complicated financial instrument, particularly one that exists over the balance sheet date, that's going to need to be at fair value. And the most common financial instrument that we come across in real life is a forward foreign exchange contract. So lots of you out there will be engaged in transactions in euros, you'll be engaged in transactions in dollars. And many of you will buy your dollars or your euros on a forward foreign exchange contract. Some of you may even sell your euros or your dollars on a forward foreign exchange contract in order to fix the exchange rate for the transaction. Now that forward foreign exchange contract is a financial instrument. And it's a financial instrument that needs to be valued at fair value if it exists at the balance sheet date. Under existing UK accounting rules, we're not required to value financial instruments like a forward foreign exchange contract at fair value at the balance sheet date. So this represents a big change because going forward into FRS 102, we will be required to value those forward foreign exchange contracts at fair value at the balance sheet date. And that will introduce either a gain on foreign exchange or a loss on foreign exchange into your statement of comprehensive income. And that may also create a tax issue. If you generate a gain on your forward foreign exchange contracts, then that may be taxable. Equally, if you generate a loss, then that may be allowable against your taxable profit. So not only is there a reporting impact here, but there may be a tax issue for some of you as well. The other area that's linked into forward foreign exchange contracts is simply carrying out a trade or some kind of transaction in a foreign currency. So if you buy a fixed asset in euros or you buy a, um, something for cost of sales in, say, dollars, the accounting treatment for that at the moment is if you have a forward foreign exchange contract, you account for that transaction at the rate in your forward foreign exchange contract. Under FRS 102, you're not allowed to do that. Under FRS 102, you have to account for the transaction at the rate ruling on the date the transaction takes place. And the forward foreign exchange contract is treated as a totally separate item showing either a gain or a loss over the balance sheet date. So there will be some key changes involving both financial instruments and fair value accounting and also particularly the accounting treatment for transactions that take place in a foreign currency. Now again, it's a very complex area, and in the few minutes that I've just outlined the major change, I can't give you all the detail. But you do need to make sure that if you're engaged in foreign exchange transactions, that you talk with your accountant, or if you are the accountant, that you understand the impact of the changes that fair value accounting will have on the financial instruments and also the changes on your foreign currency transactions will have on your client's uh, statement of comprehensive income. So there are a number of key issues hidden under the heading of financial instruments and also foreign transactions.
Okay, there are a couple of slides coming up now that just summarise what is going on with financial instruments and underline the fair value accounting elements of that. That concludes this video on the key issues associated with FRS 102. As I've already indicated at the beginning of this video, FRS 102 is a complicated change. We can't possibly go through all the detail in the 20 odd minutes that we've had for this video. We do have coming up, however, on our 2015 courses program, some more detailed courses that look at some of the intricacies involved in moving to FRS 102. Now, if you're an accountant in practice, you need to make sure when planning your own CPD over 2015 that you go on enough FRS 102 training to understand the changes and the impact it'll have on your client base. If you're an accountant in industry, perhaps a finance director or somebody responsible for preparing the statutory accounts for a company, then we also have some courses in here that'll be suitable for you, what's known as our Accountants in Business program, and that'll look at some of the key issues faced by individual companies and what they need to understand in terms of FRS 102. So, some exciting changes coming through. We need to manage these changes, and you as a finance professional or you as an accountant need to understand where those changes are taking you. So make sure you get on the right course and keep yourself up to date. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Adrian. That was very helpful. Of course, that was quite a short session. As Adrian has mentioned, FRS 102 is a large document. It does represent a big shift in some of the reporting concepts. And so we would encourage you to get the right advice. If you're a firm of accountants, then please do speak to us and have a look at our website for course ideas. If you're in a business and you run your own company, then please do look at our website or talk to the accountant that's helping you with your accounts for specific advice on your company. Thank you for watching and I hope that was helpful.